Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Waste Connection stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Waste Connections is a waste services company that provides waste collection, transfer, disposal, and recycling services. The company is headquartered in Ontario, Canada and was founded in 1997. It went public in 1998 and currently trades on the NASDAQ. It also trades on the TSX under ticker WCN. It has 7 million customers in 43 states and 6 Canadian provinces. It is the third largest waste management company in North America. Its primary business is to provide solid waste collection and disposal services through contracts with municipalities for an agreed upon rate. It also provides services directly to residential, commercial, and industrial customers. 67% of its revenue is from solid waste collection, 21% from solid waste disposal and transfer, 4% from recycling, 5% from oil waste and 3% other. And 16% of its revenue is in Canada, 84% in the United States. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 27 billion market cap. They're trading at 103 a share and they have 263 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. You can see the company has positive and consistent free cash flow each year. The easiest way to value a company is when they have consistent numbers. It doesn't matter if they're good or bad, as long as they're consistent, then it's a lot easier to estimate the future. When the numbers are really volatile, it makes it hard to predict. Below that is net income, which is a profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. That was pretty consistent, but dropped in 2020 to 200 million. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that grows each year from 4.6 billion to 5.4 billion. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. And the difference is the gross profit. Their gross profit has been growing from 2017 to 2019. It dropped a little in 2020. Below that is operating expenses. Then below that is operating income. That also peaked in 2019, a little lower in 2020. Below that is their interest payments. They received $5 million of interest income from their investments and they paid $162 million of interest expenses. This is the interest they pay in their debt. It appears that their interest payments are increasing each year from $125 million to $162 million. Below that is other income and expenses, and this dollar amount each year mainly comes from impairments of capital assets. An asset impairment is when a company decreases the value of an asset on its balance sheet and then passes through the loss onto its income statement. This is a non-cash item, so it doesn't affect cash flow. Below that is pre-tax income, then their taxes, and the bottom line of the income statement is their net income. And the reason their net income was so low in 2020 compared to the other years was this large asset impairment. I would focus on operating income when looking at the income statement. That's a better indicator of the company's business. The stuff below operating income is not part of their operational business and it can skew the numbers. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. Net income is your accounting profit and loss. It's not actual cash. So you can see the company generated $1.4 billion of operating cash flow in 2020. They did peak in 2019 at 1.5 billion. Then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And this company has a good amount of free cash flow left over each year. This company does pay a dividend, 
but another way to reward shareholders is to buy back stock. When a company buys back stock, it decreases the shares outstanding, making your shares more valuable. They bought back 58 million in 2018 and 105 million in 2020. They also add debt each year. They issued 970 million of debt in 2017 and paid down 770 million. So they added 200 million that year. They added a little bit of debt in 2018. They also added about 100 million in 2019 and about 250 million in 2020. They do have enough free cash flow to pay their dividend payments. So they're probably adding debt to acquire other businesses. Let's look at the capital structure. $7 billion of equity, $5 billion of debt. Their 58% equity, 42% debt. And their WAC is 6.7%. And that's the discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 28 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $25 billion. We divide that by 263 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $96. They're trading at 103, so they're trading at an 8% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Simply Wall Street is a little lower than me. They're at $92, so they're also saying the stock is overvalued. In the past three months, five analysts priced this stock and their average price target was 118. So they're saying the stock is undervalued. The stock has done really well the past five years. It looks like the stock was around $50 back in 2016 and it doubled since then, over $100 currently. And they seem to raise their dividend each year up to 21 cents a share. And their dividend yield is 0.79%. They pay out 105% of their net income and 29% of their free cash flow. Their dividend of 0.8% is below the industry average of 1.4%, and it's in the bottom 25% of the market. The bottom 25% of the market is 1.3%. The analyst forecast for the dividend in the next three years is 0.9%. They have a low beta 0.67, so the stock moves less than the market. The stock has gone up 19% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P 500 went up 65%. The 52-week low was 71, the high was 111. And the stock is trading above its 200-day and 50-day moving average. About 1 million shares are traded each day on this stock. Almost all the shares outstanding are on float. 89% are held by institutions, and less than 1% of the shares are shorted. If you include dividends, this stock has increased 28% in the past year, which is worse in the industry and the market. In the past three years, the stock has increased 45%, which is a little worse in the industry and a bit worse in the market. Analysts are forecasting earnings on this company to grow 41%, the industry 23%, and the market 19%. But the numbers are different for revenue growth. They're lower in revenue growth at 6.1%, the industry is 6.6%, and the market is 10%. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago and reinvested the dividends, you'd have $60,000 today. That's a 20% annual return. The biggest shareholder is T. Rowe Price at 11%, then Vanguard, Capital Research, BMO, and BlackRock. Let's look at the financial ratios. The average PE in the market is 8.6. The median is 13.7. PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They're at 132.9. So investors are paying $133 for $1 of earnings. Price to sales is stock price over sales per share. They're at 5.0, which is between the median and average. Price to book is stock price of a book value per share, they're at 4.0. And the way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities in the balance sheet, and they have 7 billion of equity, negative 22 million of tangible equity, since they have 7 billion of intangible assets on their balance sheet. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense, they're at 5.4. ROE is net income over equity, they're only at 3%. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities, they have a good current ratio 
And their current assets are 600 million of cash and 600 million of receivables. So the company does seem to be well capitalized. They generated over $700 million of free cash flow in 2020. They have nearly $400 million of working capital and they have a $200 million dividend payment. So they have $900 million of funding. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. I also did a video on waste management and waste connections is here. Waste management is doing better in price to earnings, price to sales, but waste connection is doing better in price to book. They both have a current ratio above one. Waste management has a much better ROE, but waste connections is doing better in debt at 42% compared to 65%. Waste management is almost double the size and pays a much bigger dividend. So to summarize, I have them trading at an 8% premium, but this company seems to be doing well, growing their business, generating positive free cash flow and profits. Plus they're in an industry that technology can't really take away. We're gonna always need garbage removal. And this company has done a great job at scaling that business. There's also opportunity for them to move into other countries. I rank their free cash flows five out of 10, their revenue seven out of 10, and their ratios four out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.